tread the road of the saints above, which shouts of triumph wrought. By faith they like a whirlwind breath swept on o'er every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still or shining shield. Faith is the vision. Scripture can be found in 1 Samuel 17, 45 through 47, where you can read it as we follow on the screen, or it's in your bulletin. 1 Samuel 17, 45 through 47. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. Hand, and I will strike and take your, car, take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcass of the, I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth that the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and with spear, for the battle is the Lord, and he will give you into our hands. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. Good morning, church family. I hope everybody's doing well. It's good to visit again this wonderful congregation. We always find so much love here, and so it's good to be here. Um, you know, I need the clicker for to advance this, the PowerPoint. Thank you. Uh, greetings from Chesapeake. Um, that's where your servant uh, works um, as ministerial director and really enjoy working there. I also do family ministry. And last Sabbath, we had the joy of doing a marriage enrichment event. And we had 100 people come. 
And it's such a blessing. It's good to invest in your marriage. So I hope that all you folks married in this church are investing in it to make it a, a better, better marriage. Well, well, they get organized. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get started with God's word for this morning. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love, your grace, your power. I pray, Lord, that as we open your word, you'll speak to us and that you will draw us closer to you. Let this uh, man be your instrument, Lord, and that in all we do, we'll bring honor and glory to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, so a few days ago, I had the um, um, honor of speaking for a... Um, men's retreat, and I, I use this sermon that I'm going to share with you this morning, and i um, waiting for it to come up so we can start it, but uh, it had to do with stepping up and being counted, which is something that we need in Christianity today. Christianity today is struggling because we are not what we used to be, and so we're struggling with that. Oh, okay. You have a remote? Oh, you are the remote. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 Sorry about that. All right. Well, it's, it's a live remote, so that, that makes it better. Um, so I told you that the, uh, the uh, presentation started originally is, is meant for men, and, and yet it can be applied to everybody. But I, I, I struggle with, do I leave this in? Do I take it out? And I thought, well, we're going to have men in our audience, right? <laughs> so might as well speak to them because in reality, my friends, and I, I, I want to be as honest as I, as I can. Guys, don't get mad at me. But men are not stepping up in ministry as they should be stepping up in ministry, in religion, in our relationship with God, and in our families, right? I don't hear any sisters saying amen. <laughs> it is a struggle that we're having in society, and it's happening all over the place, not just in the church. It's happening all over the place is that uh, men are not stepping up, and so many times women are taking their place. Not that women uh, don't have a right that they can't know. I'm not, it has nothing to do with that. It's just the fact that because there are voids in society, there are voids at work, there are voids in the church, then uh, women are stepping up. And I, I praise the Lord for that because, you know, we need everyone involved in ministry. But what happens when men are not stepping up and doing what they need to be doing? So I start talking to men, and then we'll, we'll include it to everybody. But notice what it says here. According to Kelly, and this is from an article, uh, it says, an author and co-founder of the youth advocacy group Dads and Daughters, expectations for men are not where they should be. Now, we have a cartoon here. Um, I forget the name of the cartoon, but it's the son is the one that is writing on his father's, uh, the back of his head. It says, insert a brain here. And, and when you think about it, people say, oh, that's funny. But in reality, what's going on is that in the media, men are being portrayed as uh, not as smart, as not sufficient, as not having the smarts that needs to function well. Let's go to the next one. <clears throat> it says, not only have these attitudes and low standards worked their way into majority of men in the media, they have worked in their way into where? Do you see what it says here? Into our homes. So what's happening is that not only is man being portrayed as uh, dumb, as a very much an animal that acts on his impulses but don't think about others, but then is doing something to our children as they're growing up. They're growing up with this idea of what men is and what men are and what there should be. If you hear a lie enough, everyone starts to believe it is true. And so it is the, the superiority of one gender of, of, over the other, when in reality, we all should realize that we all created by God, all giving great gifts to honor God. Amen? 
and to, and to serve him and to make a difference for our kingdom. And so that's why it's important to understand this. Nowadays, more and more female characters are becoming the savior, the most agile, the capable of saving the day or whatever the clip movie situation is portraying. And, and so what it does is it puts men in a situation where they're not stepping up because society is saying, we don't need you anymore. And that's happening more and more again uh, through the media and through many other means. We're living in a moment when boys seem to be lagging behind women in school, in college, college admissions, and in performance. Just, just a couple of weeks ago, I was driving around listening to, a, to the news, and there was a report on Maryland. And so, you know, I'm not going to compare it to this area, but in Maryland, they were given the report that indeed young boys are actually lagging behind precisely in these areas. And, and, and studies in school, they're performing under level of the uh, girls. Boys are getting behind. And it's because of this influence and because of what media is doing in connection with these things. So he continues saying, and even in life to some degree, it's so crazy to wonder whether boys are getting the message that our society simply expects less from them. And that's okay to be clueless. Let goes, let's go to the next one. Uh, many in the hip-hop generation believe that being uneducated is keeping it real. That man's responsibility to his child is the sperm donor or uh, that he donated to the mother. And that prison is a rite of passage. And so it really, really minimizes the, men, the role of men in society. Now, if that wasn't enough, then let's bring it up to then another level. So when we make it more comprehensive to our setting. And that means for you and I. And that is Christianity. Christianity has come to a point nowadays where actually it means much less than I ever, ever meant. What does it mean to be a Christian today? Now, don't, you know, I'm not asking so you answer something. I'm asking you so you think about it. What does it mean to be a Christian today? Well, it depends on the circles in which you roam. It depends on the people that you mingle with. But in many, in many circles, being a Christian is actually being seen the same way or a similar way as we're thinking about the role of men in society. As someone that is not educated, right? Have you heard that? As someone that is fanatical, not with a lot of sense in his brain, and not understanding things um, like science. Because there's this struggle between science and religion and which one is right and which was wrong. Now, if you ask me, and, and I'm, I'm an educated man, and if you ask me, I'll say God is always right. Regardless of what society says, regardless of what science says, regardless of what any other things that society wants to bring us and tell us that, you know, God doesn't really exist because of this and that, there is a million reasons why I believe that God is alive, that He lives, that He's active, and there are many ways that we can show how God is working in our lives because when you have faith and you believe and you can then see the evidence of God, then your faith is different. Amen? So what does that mean? So what I'm trying to tell you is that, yes, and so that's why I, le I left this section here because I thought, yes, in reality, in society, men are being put down. And the church men are stepping up, away, and down. And in, in life, we as Christians are facing great difficulty with our faith because of many things that are going on. But the bottom line is, we can believe in God. And God is real, and God is working in our midst and making a big difference for us. And we can see the evidence of God all around us. All right? So having said that, let's go to the next one. We are living in a time that was actually prophesied some time ago. And when I read this the first time, which was a few years back, when I read it the first time, I was like, wow, this is like written for us today in this moment in time because of what it says. So let's go ahead and read it. I mean, I'm going to read it aloud. You can follow with me. But notice the, the very carefully crafted words that uh, Sister White uses to put this together. So she says, When the religion of Christ is most held in contempt, when his law is most despised, then should our seal be the warmest and our courage and firmness forsake us. Did you catch this one? You want me to read it again? Or you got it? Let's go to the next, next slide. It says, To fight the battles of the Lord when champions are what? Few, it says. When champions are few. 
This will be our test. At this time, we must gather warmth from the coldness of others, courage from the cowardice, and loyalty from their treason. Wow. Well, I mean, do you agree with me? Isn't this a timely text for us today? A message, a, 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 a word of encouragement for us today? Because that's what we're dealing with. And that's what we're facing today. Let's break it down a little bit. Next one. It says, when um, we skip one. Can you go back, please? Uh, no, back, back. <laughs> the other way. There you go. All right. One more time. Oh, wow. It's missing one slide. All right. Next one. Okay. One more time. So I'm missing one. So let's, let's go back to the uh, quotation. All right. So one more and one more. Okay. So what, what is it saying? Look at this. When the religion is Christ of Christ is most held in contempt. That's what we're dealing with today. Now, you, you may be in an area that is still part of the Bible belt. It's probably not the buckle, but, but it's part of the belt. And so you find, you find many Christians in your area here. And that's, that's wonderful because there's people that believe in God, already believe in God, but they still need to know more about God so, so they can love Him more and they convey Him more. But when you're traveling abroad, when you go into the very big, greater cities or, or, or areas that are less, they have less Christians, you find that this is so true, and it is applicable today like never before. The religion of Christ today is being held in contempt. What is the religion of Christ? You guys know what that is? Christianity, right? Isn't that what it is? Christianity. Christianity, because if you go to the book of Acts, you might remember that there was a group of people that lived so much like Christ that they began to be called, what? Christians. By the way, that this is just for the, for the sake of testing your brain. See, see how your brains are working. Why were they called before they were called Christians? I'm sorry? Followers of the way. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, the life, right? And for the, big, the first few years, that group of believers of Jesus, that group of early, the early Christian church was actually called the followers of the way. Good job, sister. And so they were called followers of the way until then people started to say, well, these people are just like Christ. They behave like Christ. They act like Christ. They live like Christ. So we should be them, calling them what? Christians. Now, my question for you this morning is, are Christians today living, acting like Jesus? Do they, do they really exemplify what Jesus is all about? And my friends, the true answer is, and I'm talking about the world, uh, the Christian world. I'm not talking about you this morning or this church this morning. I'm talking about Christianity in general. And the answer is no. They're living by opinion. They're living by, by whatever makes them happy. And they're not really following the way of the Lord. So when the religion of Christ is most held and content, when His law is most despised. You know, here in the United States, it, the Word of God and the law is most despised. People don't want to even hear that, even though it was it was part of the principles that started our nation. Let's, let's go ahead and go forward to the ones I had. So one more time. And one more time. His laws is most despised. Let's keep going. And so then it's clear that this passage from 1882 this, the, describes what is going on in our church today and in society today. So it, it, there's coldness, there's cowardice, there's treason. And people, Christians, we, you and I, are not stepping up the way we should be stepping up, the way God wants us to be stepping up. What do we learn then from the Bible when it comes to stepping up and being counted? What do we learn from the Scripture when it comes to understanding what, is, what God is expecting us to do? And we go to the Bible and we see powerful lessons. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. We go to 1 Samuel chapter 17. And you probably, I, I think you studied this recently. The pastor was telling me that he preached on the David and Goliath recently. But notice this story. The story is of a giant, Goliath the Philistine, who comes to fight. And so in verse 4, tells us about this man, how big he was. And he tells us that he was nine and a half feet tall. And not only was he that tall, but when you think about it, he wasn't just a, a pole that was going up. He also had to have that body to go behind it. So he was humongous. It tells us that he had a bronze helmet armed with a coat of mail. He had, um, in verse 6, 
a bronze armor, bronze javelin between his shoulders. Verse 7, it says, his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron uh, spread head weighed 600 shekels. So that guy was a giant, and he was armed to the teeth, and he was invincible. And this guy will stand before the people of Israel every day for a period of time and challenge them. And no one was willing to stand up. We had men of war, seasoned men of war, that were in this people of Israel, and they were not stepping up. They were not doing what God wanted them to do was to represent them. And what these men started to do then, he started to make fun, fun not only of them, but he started to make fun of their God. Let's go to the next one. So David's reaction in verse 26, we find it. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? He starts to now take it personal because the man was attacking his God. And so he says, who is this guy that is saying this thing? Um, verse 36, your servant. Then he goes and volunteers to fight this man. And, and so he says in defense of himself, saying, I can't do this. He says, your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defeated the armies of the living God. Now, what I appreciate the most is David's reaction when he is now ready to face the giant. So the Bible tells us that the guy goes out to the field, and he stands right there in the field, and the giant then comes forward, and now it's him and the giant. And that's the part that really impresses me about David. Because we can talk the talk, right? Uh, very often we say, well, if I was there, if I would have been there, oh, that would have been so different. I would have done this and that. And we all, all talk, right? But what happens when we're confronted? What happens when it's the moment to stand, stand up and be counted? And we usually don't do it. We do all the talk, but none of the action. What happens with him? Let's go to those two verses. Uh, Rob read it to us, but I want to read it again because I think they're so powerful when you think about it. Now, again, imagine this, 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 this situation. You have a giant of a man and a young man, a young boy. He, he was a young person, not experienced in war. Even though he had fought a, a lion and a bear, he still didn't have all the training for war. And there he is, a tiny little thing in front of a huge thing. And notice his reaction. He says... To the Philistine, he says, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. I mean, what else did he want? He brought all the, all the heavy armory that he could bring at that moment for a moment of war. And, and then he says, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you in my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. Wow. I mean, isn't that impressive when you think about it? Can you put yourself in that situation? You, you're being that little, little person confronting that huge person and being able to stand up for God and tell them that he was wrong in what he was doing. Do we do that today? Let's go to, let's go to more examples in the Bible. Let's, let's skip the next one and go to another one. All right. So, oh, sorry. Yes, one more time. All right. So, people that stepped up in the Bible. Let's go to this one. All right. Ah, okay, I don't know what's going on here, but we lost a lot of things. All right. So, who else do we have in the Bible that has stepped up and make a tremendous difference? So, we go to Joshua and Caleb. And I think this was in Numbers 11.30. Boy, I hope this is right because... I had it in my notes, and now it's not there. I have to figure out what happened to that. Okay, I know where it is. It's in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 1. All right. So the story that tells us in, in, in Deuteronomy, it's about the time when they were afraid to confront and go and conquer the land. <clears throat> in verse 26, it starts to say, 
But you were afraid and didn't think the Lord could give us the land. So you rebelled against him and refused to trust him what he could do for us. That was verse 26. Verse 27, you grumbled and said, the Lord brought us out of here, out here to die. And he wants to turn us over to the Amorites to destroy us. Where do we go now? The men explored the land and told us how huge and strong the Amorites were, that the cities were fortified with walls so high they looked as if they were touching the sky, and that the Anakites who lived there were giants. We doubt it can ever go and possess the land. I begged you at the time not to discourage or terrify by what you heard, but to obey the Lord and step out in faith. And then he goes on to encourage the people of Israel. But there were two men there. That was Joshua and Caleb. They were 12 spies that were sent out to explore the land. And out of the 12, 10 gave a good report. They said, eh, the giants are big, the walls are hum humongous, but we can do it in the name of the Lord. That was Joshua and Caleb. The rest of the spies said, no, these people are too big. The, you know the story. The story tells us that God, and this is right there in chapter 1 of Deuteronomy, how God says, all right, because of this, the rest of you are going to go wander in the land for 40 years. But Joshua and Caleb didn't die. They survived because of their trust in God. We go to the book of Joshua, and actually we find Joshua leading the army of Israel 40 years later, conquering the same land. And then we find a text. It's Joshua chapter 12 and verse 14. No, I'm sorry. It's 14 and verse 12. I, was, I had it back. All right. Did you find it? It's not there. It's not showing up for some reason. I don't know why, but it's not showing up. I had it. I reviewed it this morning. It was there. So, okay. Did you find it? Joshua chapter 14 and verse 12. So remember the background. So 40 years later, actually 45, if you read the context, 45 years earlier, they were ready to enter the land. Joshua and Caleb said, yes, we can do it. The rest of the people say, no, they died in the desert. And now we find Caleb. And what is Caleb saying? This is 45 years later. He's saying, uh, verse 12, so give me that mountain that we walked over, that the Lord promised me after he had given our report and urged the people to move forward in faith. You were there and heard what I said about the giant called Anakim. And the great walled cities and how the Lord's help, we could defeat it, defeat, it, defeat them and drive them out. And Joshua, verse 13, blessed Caleb for his faithfulness and gave him the city of Hebron and the mountain that he was asking for, etc., etc., etc. Forty-five years later, he's able to claim that same land that he said, we can do it. So he had actually stepped up in faith and was able to conquer the land. And what about other Bible heroes? We think of, we think of um, Esther and the moment when, when she has to go and, and present herself before the king to plead for his people. And you remember what Esther said? Esther said, because the, the warning was, if you go into the presence of the king without being asked for, then you may be killed. And what did Esther said? If I die, I die, right? It was a moment when she needed to step up, and she did step up. Let's keep going. Let's see if, I, if, if any others stand up. Man, what happened with this? They are all disappear. Okay, next. All right, let's, so let's stop there. So let's, let's think of another one in the book of Acts. So let's go to the book of Acts. And this is chapter, I want to say chapter 4. Yes, and verse 5. Uh, starting in verse 5. So what is the context? So we have Peter who actually had been uh, sent to jail because of the preaching of the gospel. And now they let him out of the prison and they send him out. And notice what happens. They tell him, you should not speak in the name of Jesus. We don't want you to be speaking in the name of Jesus. All right. Verse 8. Peter says, Peter, fill. 
Um, by power, okay. I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find the section where they said... Um, Oh, yeah, I found it. Okay, verse 19. So they have preached them their message. They put him in jail. Now they let him out, and they said, don't preach. And here comes Peter and says, Peter and John, actually two of them, said, whether it's more important to listen to God or to men, you have to decide yourselves. But as ourselves, for ourselves, we have decided that if people ask us what happened today in the temple, or if they ask us to tell more about Jesus, we have no choice but to tell them the truth or we have seen and we have heard. Wow, interesting, right? So they, they are before the officers, soldiers, I imagine. I mean, they're, they're, they're giving the mean looks and everything. They said, don't say anything about Jesus. And what is his reaction? He says, if I have to tell people about Jesus, I will. And that is his reaction. My friends, what is your reaction? What is my reaction? When we have a time and opportunity today in a, in a world where we're not being persecuted for our faith to tell someone about Jesus, what do we do? How do we react? And how is it that we, that we can be able to step up and be counted? How does that happen? And there's a way to do it, my friends. Number one is that we understand the love of God for us and accept His love in our lives. Okay? Does that make sense? We accept Jesus as our Savior. We let Him come into our lives, and then He starts to transform us and make us into His image. That's number one thing. But the number two is very important, and that is that we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. Because that was what made the difference in the people of the Old Testament. That's what made people in the difference in the early church. And that's what making the difference in God's people today is to be, ba to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's see if this is going to work now. So in Luke chapter 11, it tells us, how is it that we receive the power of the Holy Spirit? Do you know how to receive the power of the Holy Spirit? It's very easy. Let's, lo let's go to it. Luke chapter 11. All right. And it is right there in verse 13. Did you find it? I don't think it's going to show up here, so might as well find it. Luke eleven thirteen. You know, earlier when I was sitting here, I thought, what if it doesn't work? And then I thought, oh, no, it's going to work. It's going to be all right. And there you go, technology. You can't trust technology. All right. Did you find it? All right. Notice what it says. So the question that I'm presenting before you is, if you need the power of the, power of the Holy Spirit in your life, How do you receive the, the Holy Spirit? How is it that you can have that power working in your life? And here it tells you what is the formula, what is the secret, how do you receive the Holy Spirit? It says, if you who are born in a sinful world know how to give good things to your children, how much more willing, how much more willing your Heavenly Father is to give the Holy Spirit to those that ask. Isn't that awesome? As simple as that. So all we have to do, my friends, is ask for the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and God will give it to us. Uh, I presented to you a number of, of Bible heroes, and, and, and because of time, I, I, I could go to many more. But I want to introduce to you one that is actually the most powerful example in stepping up at the moment that was most needed. So let's go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, this one is showing up, so I'm glad to see that. And we start in verse 17. It says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. Next. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lunacy, to, to work all on cleanliness and greediness. So hold on a second. So it's telling us that because of the work of Jesus Christ, we no longer live in this world that he just described. And then he makes a powerful statement. Next one. He says, but you have not so learned Christ. You have not so learned Christ. Christ. What 
do we love? What do we learn from Jesus Christ? When it comes to stepping up and taking action and being counted, what do we learn from him? And we learn from him the most powerful lesson. Well, let's go to the next one. Uh, actually, one more time. What do we learn from him? This is Philippians chapter 2. And it tells us about the moment when Jesus Christ stepped up to make a difference. He said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of not reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. And my friends, we find that when it counted, God stepped up for our salvation. Isn't that awesome? The most powerful example we find in the Bible is that when there was a moment that it counted, Jesus Christ said, I'll do it. Not only did he say, I'll do it, but when it came to time, he did it. He came to this world. And he did not, he did not came to this world as a God in the sense of, you know, acting like a God and, and demanding like a No, he came and became one of us, took our form, died on the cross. And, and, and rested and then was resurrected, not only to pay for our sins, but to give us the hope of eternal life. And I say, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Because it is because of Jesus was willing to step up that we have hope and eternal life today. Let's go to the next one. So my friends, filled with the Holy Spirit, covered by, the Christ, of, by, by, covered by Christ, and surrendered to Jesus, is how we step up and we're counted. Without him, we cannot do it. Without Jesus, we have no victory in our lives. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, we cannot have victory. But with him and with his Holy Spirit in our lives, we can actually do that. Step up and be counted. And then we can see the difference. I love this, uh, this passage. It's from Education, page, page 57. Now, uh, ladies, I want you to be included here. So when it says men... Let's, let's say men and women, because in reality it's for all of us. The world is looking for people that will step up and make a difference. And we can do that. You and I can do that if we surrender our lives to Christ. Notice what it says. The greatest want of the world is the want of men and women who will not be bought or sold. Oh, my friends, it's asking about courage. It's asking for us to be determined in where we are standing and take a, a strong stand in what we believe. Men who in their inmost souls are true and honest. Men who do not fear to call sin by his right name. Men whose circ conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole. Men and women who will stand for right though the heavens fall. That's the challenge that God has for us today. What do you think? That's the challenge that God has is giving you today. It reminds me of, of a friend of mine, a good friend who I was, I was pastoring in a certain place, and one day he came and said, Pastor, I want to be rebaptized. I says, uh, so he had a nice family, his wife, his kids in the church. And I said, why do you want to be rebaptized? He says, Pastor, I, let me tell you why I want to be rebaptized. And he started to share this story with me. He said that for a long time at work, for a long time at work, he had not told anyone that he was a Christian. Now, if that wasn't enough, or if that wasn't bad enough, let me just put it like that. Not only did he not tell them that he was a Christian, he behaved like they behave. He drank what they drank. He used the words that they used. I'm sure I'm painting a picture that you understand. So he was living as someone without faith, without trust, without relationship with Jesus Christ. And he said to me, and I'm tired of that, and I want to start living right. I think it's time for me to have a total and true surrender of my life to Jesus Christ. I, I have never forgotten that moment because how many of us, and don't raise your hand, but how many of us go on living like if we're not Christians, telling the world nothing about our faith and th thinking that it's going to be all right. He stepped up 
A young man gave his life to Jesus all over again. I had the joy of rebaptizing him, came out of the water, a new person, and became one of the most active members in his church, in our church. Stepped up in the moment when needed to be counted. This morning, I'm going to ask you a question. And it's a simple one. Are you living the life that Jesus Christ wants you to live? Are you stepping up? Are you telling the world that you're a Christian? Not just some, only with your words, but with your actions. Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to make a difference for those around you? Because of what He's doing in your life and how He is working through your life. Or you are, or are you a closet Christian who just comes to church but no one knows what you really are? If your answer is yes, that you're not living, I want to challenge you this morning to step up. Men, I want to challenge you to step up, make a difference. And women, I want you too to step up and, and take this challenge and live the way that God wants you to live. Filled with the Spirit and ready to make a difference for His kingdom. Now, this morning we're having a special event. And it is uh, a few men and women that are stepping up. They are decided that they are going to be uh, accept the call that God has given them to be elders and deacons in the church. And to me, that is a stepping up. To me, that is stepping up and making a difference for God's kingdom. The Bible tells us in Titus chapter 1 and starting in verse 5. And notice the way it says it. And it's, it's not going to be on the screen, so might as well look it up. Titus chapter 1 and verse 5. All right. It says, the reason I left you in Crete was so you could do some things that were still needed to be done. This is Peter talking to Titus. And he says, you need to select and ordain elders for every congregation on the island, just as I ask you to do elsewhere. This church have asked a number of men and women to step up and be counted. And they have taken the challenge to be elders. I'm going to ask uh, those that have been nominated to be ordained as elders of our congregation to come forward at this moment. I'm going to ask uh, our elders, current elders of our church, to also come forward because we're going to lay hands on these men and women and ordain them because they're acting, they're accepting the call to be elders. And notice what it says about the office of eldership. It says, an elder must be someone who has a blameless reputation only has one wife or one husband. His children should be believers and not wild and rebellious. They should not be arrogant or quick temper, and certainly not one who drinks, gets into fights, or is known as, a, as greedy for money. I love this next verse. It says, He should love people, be hospitable, hospitable and interested in doing good, be fair, holy, and self-disciplined. And should be faithful to God's message as it has been taught to be able to teach it faithfully to others and expose the errors of those who oppose it. So my friends, there's a group of men and women that have accepted the call to eldership and this morning they're going to be um, ordained as elders in our church. Can we make this one work? Would you tell us about who these elders are? Of course, of course. Um, so this morning we have uh, two from our congregation and one from the Manio congregation. So our uh, two elders who are being ordained this morning is Michael Thompson and Debbie Roberts. And um, they have both have been serving on the Elders Council and they've both been working for some time. And today they're being ordained to full elders ministry. And from the Manio Church, we have Saulo de Leon, and he has been serving there as the group leader. And so now he will be also ordained as an elder. Thank you so much, Pastor. So what, what we're going to do now is we're going to kneel here where we are. Are you all three able to kneel? Okay. So we'll kneel, we'll kneel together. And I want the elders, uh, our church elders that are ordained, then to surround them. And as we pray, as I pray, we're going to lay hands on them as an act of ordaining them to the eldership, the ministry of eldership. It, we can also have you seating if you, that's better. It's okay. All right. 
Okay, um, I got a mic. So we're going to kneel, and we're going to pray, and we're going to ordain them in the name of the Lord. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this man and woman who have stood up and decided to be counted. We know, Lord, that is is a job with a lot of responsibility. They are the pastor's right hand. They're not here to fight or keep the pastor in check. They're here to support the pastor and make a difference for your kingdom. And when there is an absence of a pastor, Lord, they are the pastors of the church. So this morning, Father, we pray for each one of them as they are being ordained to the ministry, that they will do their best to serve you with all their hearts. They are not perfect, Lord. We know that they're humans. But let them call unto you and run to you every time that they are in need. And when the enemy attacks, Lord, let them surrender their lives before you. And I pray, Lord, that in a very special way, they will be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, I want to pray for Michael as we lay hands on him that he truly will be your instrument, serving you with all his heart. Set aside, that's what laying hands on him means, set aside to serve you and make a difference for your kingdom. Father, as we lay hands on Debbie, we pray that she too will be an instrument in your hands, a powerful instrument to make a difference for your kingdom, filled with your Holy Spirit. And Lord, and I'm going to switch languages here, Lord, Oramos también por Saulo, para que Saulo pueda ser tu instrumento como anciano de iglesia, lleno del poder de tu Espíritu Santo, para traer honor y honra y gloria a tu nombre. Ponemos nuestras manos como sobre él para ordenarlo en el ministerio del ancianato. So Lord, we, pray, we bring these three people before you. We pray, Lord, that they will be strong because you're strong in them. And that they will be wise because your Holy Spirit guides them. And that they will be faithful because of the love they have for Jesus Christ. We do this prayer and we do it all, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 Let's, uh, you guys stay up and we'll pray for the deacons and deaconesses. So now they are ordained elders. <laughs> and now they can pray and lay hands on the next group. So the next group is a group of deacons and deaconesses who are going to be ordained in ministry. And I love how the Bible tells us about the first group of deacons and deaconesses. We find in the books of Acts chapter 6. And I'm not going to read this story because the time is against us right now. But it tells about the time when the church was needing help. And help was provided through the ministry of the deacons and deaconesses. In fact, in Acts 16, it tells us about a deaconess who was serving the Lord. So we know that these are people that are called to serve the church. They're not just to gather offerings. Sometimes people think that deacons and deaconesses, all they do is pick up the offerings. They care for the church family. They care for the members. They care for the building. And so I pray and I ask now that deacons and deaconesses come forward, those that are going to be ordained. uh, Step up at this moment. Los diáconos y diaconesses que van a ser ordenados, que pasen. And so as they're coming forward, I'm going to ask Pastor Eli to tell us about them. Yes, and so we have uh, two deaconesses that are being ordained here and, um, and a deacon that's being ordained for Manio. So we have our sister Kelly Petty, who has been serving as the head deaconess, and uh, so she will be ordained. And we have also Micah Thompson, who's been serving as well, and, um, and we're going to be ordaining her. And we have our brother Álvaro López Cueto, who will be ordained to serve as a deacon in Manio. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Eli. All right. So again, we're going to kneel. I'm going to ask you to kneel in the middle. En el centro aquí, juntigos. And the elders all around. Yeah, yeah. You you may sit down. It's better for you. All right. There you go. And so now the elders, please, surround them and lay hands on them as we're praying. And uh, let's join by bowing our heads as we pray. Oh, Lord, what a joy it is to be asked to serve as a deacon or deaconess in our church. Lord, it is a great privilege because you are a servant. You came in the form of a servant, Lord. You gave us the example of what it is to serve others. And so as these individuals are chosen, these this, this, uh, men and women are chosen to serve you, I pray, Lord, that they will do it because of the great love they have for you. 
I want to pray, Lord, for Sister Kelly as she's being surrounded by the elders, as hands are laid on her. Lord, that she will set us be set aside to serve you with all her heart, her love for you, Lord. That it will be a love service and she will be filled with your spirit as an instrument of your grace. I pray also, Father, for, for Micah, that, that she too, as we lay hands on her, that the Holy Spirit will be uh, strong in her. And Lord, we're reminded of what the deacons of the early church did. They didn't only serve the church, they were preachers and evangelists. Mm. I pray, Father, that they too will have the gift and tell the world about Jesus. Y Lord, um, también quiero orar por Álvaro, Father, uh, Padre. Te pido, Señor, que lo bendigas, que él sea tu instrumento, que al ser ungido como anciano, como diácono en esta mañana, que él se dé cuenta del servicio que hay, de la oportunidad de hacer una diferencia para tu reino y que esté lleno de tu Santo Espíritu y que el amor de Cristo es el que lo dirija. Lord, we give you thanks for these people that today have stepped up and they are being counted, Lord. That they will make a difference in their churches, not only for the church, but for your kingdom. And we pray for this blessing and we do it all in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Before you uh, go to your seat, we just we have a few things that we'd like to give you. Um, Glenn, could you get the books that are on my desk? So we have here some nice uh, certificates of ordination. And so there's one for each of you. Debbie, we have The Incredible Power of Prayer by Roger Morneau. So, and for Mr. Michael, we have The Incredible Power of Prayer by um, Roger Morneau. And for Ms. Micah, we have Power Prayers for Women. So, And then we have, for Ms. Kelly, A Hundred Things God Loves About You and Why I Love You Too. <laughs> for Saulo, uh, wait, uh, no, for Alvaro, we have Administradores del Señor, administrators of, of the Lord. And so, para servirte en tu ministerio. And for Saulo, we have para líderes emergentes, for emerging leaders in ministry. So, para que te puedas servir en tu ministerio. Que Dios le bendiga. Pueden tomar así. Congratulations. Congratulations. Oh, um, oh yeah, yeah. Congratulations. Vamos a... Saludarles. still have a song that we're going to sing and then we have uh, the closing um, prayer for by Elder Wade. but I want to encourage you that as we sing this closing song uh, the title of the song is a stand up stand up for Jesus I want to encourage you that as you stand up that in your mind you're also making the decision to stand up and be counted because we're living in a time when we need to do that as Christians as followers of Jesus we need to stand up and be counted Amen.